Daniel Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. We have with us Yaron Brook, former chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute, author of Free Market Revolution and Freedom. What was the other one? Equal is unfair. Equal is unfair. I have to apologize to Yaron because I just moved here. My stuff is all in boxes. I'm still, and my friend Matthew's house has been so generous as to let me use his and, machinery. Uh, and, Yaron, and I, I had the and I am the current chairman and former CEO. Oh, former CEO. I thank you for that correction, and I apologize about that. Uh, I had the pleasure of running into you uh, last week while you were here in Austin uh, at the Objectivist Conference with Rucka. Now, something you were telling me was pretty interesting. For people who don't know, Objectivism is the philosophy that was developed by uh, the late Ayn Rand. Uh, Rand's biggest books are, of course, The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. And after that, she expounded her philosophy in a series of nonfiction books, uh, collections of essays such as Capitalism, The Unknown Ideal, and The Virtue of Selfishness. Um, the Romantic Manifesto is another one. Uh, but you were saying that there is a huge pocket of objectivists in Austin. And more broadly, you were saying that objectivism as an organized movement is more popular now than at any time in Rand's lifetime. Is, is that correct? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think the movement is only growing, uh, both as a movement and in terms of the impact the books have on people. That is the number of people impacted by Rand, influenced by her, inspired by her, grows from decade to get decade. And certainly right now, you're seeing more serious students of objectivism than probably ever before. And Austin, Texas has become this hub where uh, a number of intellectuals, objectivist intellectuals have moved to Austin, Texas, but also people just like, like everybody else fleeing California, uh, leaving New York, uh, leaving other places. We've got two hubs right now in um, Austin, Texas is in Naples, Florida. And uh, the divide is pretty much age-related, as you would expect, right? Naples, Florida, significantly older. Uh, Austin, Texas, significantly younger. But yeah, there's definitely, you're seeing that demographic movement. You're seeing people leave uh, horrible states like, I mean, wonderful states, but horrible policies like places like California. Uh, one of the, I don't want to spoil Atlas Shrugged. And by the way, for anyone out there, make sure you read the Fountainhead before Atlas Shrugged. But one of the climax moments of Atlas Shrugged is a train wreck of the, of the international um, train line, the Comet. I have also recently witnessed another objectivist train wreck when Yaron was on the Jesse Lee Peterson show two years ago, which as I was just this past week. So Yaron, are you a beta male? Um, I don't even know what that means, but no, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. You can um, uh, look at my history, but you know, that, the difference in the train wrecks is, is that the train wreck with Jesse was man-made. Clearly, it, it was not a default. It was, um, it was his style. It was his method. It's, uh, it's the way he does it, right? But I, I was surprised because you, you're, you, objectivism prides itself on being a philosophy of, rash, of rationality. Uh, and Rand, you know, always said, Rand basically presaged what Ben Shapiro said. She said, emotions are not tools of cognition. Facts don't care about your feelings. Those are pretty similar. Concepts. Oh, oh, yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, Ben has read Ayn Rand quite a bit. So, oh, of course. That's what's um, but why were you allowing him to get you so agitated? Well, partially because I didn't know what I was getting into. So I had no idea who he was. I had no idea that this was the path that it would go uh, along. And his irrationality was unbelievably agitating. I mean, he was just irrational, obnoxious, uh, stupid. Um, and, uh, and you know, I don't have to deal with BS like that. So uh, I could have walked away. I decided to, uh, to be agitated instead. It's, uh, it makes for better TV. <laughs> That's true. That's next for better TV. I went out to dinner with uh, Raka and, and a couple of uh, other objectivists um, uh, the other week in Austin. We were discussing criticism of Ayn Rand. And I feel as if there is this concept within objectivism, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, that when people critique Ayn Rand, it is often done in, in the sense of, well, you're dismissing her accomplishments, and therefore these criticisms shouldn't really be taken seriously, because no matter how, how um, valid they might be, they still pale in comparison to what she has produced. Is, do you think that's a fair assessment of the objectivist perspective? No, I don't think so. I, I think that, oh, I don't, I don't encounter many objections to Ayn Rand that qualify as that. I, I find most uh, objections to Ayn Rand just being ill-informed and uneducated more than anything else. So they, they straw man 
usually straw manning her arguments and 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 presenting them um, in ways that just don't represent who she is and what she is. So it, it, it's not the case that people, uh, yeah, there's some stuff to criticize, but you should really appreciate her, her greatness. Very few people have that attitude. Usually people throw her out all of it and um, and misrepresent most of what she says. Very few, I've seen very few criticisms of her that actually take her ideas seriously and represent them as they are and then say, no, we disagree, right? So egoism, they don't like uh, turn egoism into some farce of, of the, you know, the, the, the selfishness being lying, cheating and stealing. Uh, it, take it seriously on its face and then say, oh, but, but we disagree with one, two, three. No, it's almost always uh, straw man. Here's one issue I have, and, and I think this isn't necessarily a criticism, Ram, but a criticism of the method in which you produce your ideas. When you're writing a novel, you're dramatizing, especially um, philosophical novels like Rambo, you're dramatizing ideas. And as a result of this, you, especially her, you're going to write at a certain level of very high intensity. Things are, you know, profound matters of life and death. At the same time, in her nonfiction and in her personal life, Rand often talked a lot about things like kindness, you know, when you're with your friends, the person you love, you mm -hmm. honor them, you appreciate their values and kind of that, that camaraderie. But that seems to be lost a bit with the grimness uh, that is the backdrop of all of her novels. And that's necessary that this is the grimness because she's fighting against it in her worldview. Do you think that this kind of causes some young people to get the wrong impression? Yes, but I, but I also think it's overstated. That is, if you read the novels, particularly if you read them a the second or third time, you know, the first time they're coming at you, right, full power, and, and maybe you miss the subtleties. And certainly when you're young, you're going to miss the subtleties and, and get caught up in the in the excitement of it. But think about Dagny um, on the train with uh, a guy uh, bumming a ride, right? He, he's on, and you think, right, you know, Dagny, she's going to take him by the, and just throw him off the train, right? He's, he's getting something free. And no, she buys him dinner. She sits down with him and talks to him. And and not only kindness, but she's curious why he is in the condition that he is. Why is this? And she's trying to understand the world around her. And part of that is trying to understand this this bum. Uh, think about uh, uh, Rourke's um, uh, finding Mallory, the sculptor, uh, who's who's destitute, who's suicidal, who's given up on life, given up on society, and he becomes a friend and becomes somebody who helps him rise up and helps him. Um, uh, manifest what his potential really is. But people don't focus on that. They focus just on the sides um, that, that in their mind are consistent with what egoism or, or selfishness means. And they ignore the subtleties in the writing, the subtleties in the storyline. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, Ayn Rand is not advocating for uh, individualism or, or egoism as living on a desert island, quite the contrary. She values civilization enormously. She values human relationships enormously. She values the values other people produce enormously. Uh, and, and I think you see that in the novels. Um, and of course, without giving it away, Gulch Gulch, the Gulch in the end is, is this wonderful place of camaraderie, uh, of people who share values and, and, and share a particular perspective on life and, and live uh, live happily uh, together in this place. So I, I think she's often, again, misinterpreted. And part of it is the enthusiasm of youth, reading it for the first time, discovering this new morality, discovering this idea of living for oneself, and then misapplying it, misinterpreting it, not completely understanding it, and, and, and rushing to convince the rest of the world obnoxiously, as obnoxiously as one can. And, and I, don't, I don't know that there's any way to skip to get around that, because uh, when a young person reads a book like this, it has an enormous impact and they don't have enough experience in the world to know better in a sense or to, to fully understand what she's talking about. There's a big kind of, uh, I don't want to say controversy, but discussion within objectivist circles or allies of objectivism about what the nature of objectivism is. Is it a closed system? Is it an open system? Is objectivism defined as that which is in Rand's novels? Is it defined as, and but then are certain, it starts to be in her books, are there certain things that are her books that can be considered not objective, objectivism, but simply her personal preference? Where do you stand on that? So I think I stand where Ayn Rand stood on this. It's her philosophy. She got to name it. She got to decide what it was. And she said very clearly that her philosophy is her writings, her philosophical writings 
comprise her philosophy. That's what objectivism refers to. That doesn't mean that is the truth. That doesn't mean philosophy is a closed system. Philosophy is obviously not a closed system. And, and philosophers in the future might discover uh, flaws in Ayn Rand. Certainly, hopefully, they will develop her thought in directions she didn't consider or in directions she did consider but never got to it. In terms of the truth of philosophy, that is an open system. But she said, look, I don't want, I mean, I'm, this is Ayn Rand saying, right? I don't want what happened to Aristotle to happen to me. I don't want all kinds of people saying I'm Aristotelian, I'm Aristotelian, and 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 distorting and perverting my ideas. I want it clear that my philosophy, objectivism, is these books, right? This is what it is. If you do beyond that, and you should do beyond that, right? It makes sense. Grow. Um, that's you. It's not me, right? Objectivism is Ayn Rand's philosophy. So it's only things that Ayn Rand said. Now, do all of her writings count? Probably not. You know, you'd have to you'd have to look writing by writing and think about it. And, and it's not obvious. Uh, some of her writings touch more on things like psychology than they do on philosophy. Maybe maybe some of the historical analysis and I don't know, capitalism, not an ideal is wrong. I, I don't know. But is that philosophy or is that history? So uh, it, there's some economics writing in some of her books. Is that economics? Is that history? Is that philosophy? So drawing the lines, I think, is 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 a project. Um and of course, I, you know, one of the books I would include in what is objectivism is uh, a couple of Leonard Peikoff's books, uh, Ominous Parallels, which she was alive and edited, so she kind of approved of it, and Opa, which is Objective and Philosophy of Ayn Rand, which is borderline because she was not alive, but it's based on lectures he gave while she was alive and she, and she gave input on. So objectivism is her philosophy, therefore it's her writings. And then there's... But that doesn't, that's not the end. I mean, it, it's fine for philosophers to say she was wrong in this, or I hey, I think there's an eighth virtue or ninth virtue or whatever. That's sure. fine. And then and then have a debate about that. Just don't call it objectivism because that's fraud. That's uh, placing somebody else's name on your ideas. Say, I am a, a, I'm based my ideas on Ayn Rand and I think this. Great. Right. Like, let me talk about, let me ask about one very specific essay. She got in a lot of heat in her life about saying why she would be against the woman president. She didn't, to be more precise, she didn't say she would be against the woman president per se, but she said that the kind of woman who would want to be president should never be president. Yeah. Yet towards the end of her life, she also spoke very highly that Margaret Thatcher was being influenced by her ideas. Uh, do you think that it is part and parcel objectivism that a woman should not aspire to be a commander in chief of the armed forces? I don't. I, I think that's a psychological observation, not a philosophical one. So I don't think that's part and parcel of objectivism. I think it's a complex issue. Uh, you know, I, I think I get in more hot water than she did around this because nobody dared question her about it. Uh, because she would knock him down. Um, and she had great arguments, partially because I think as a novelist, one of the things that as a novelist you have to develop is an acute awareness of psychology, understanding of psychology, and an ability to talk about psychology. And of course, for her, femininity and masculinity were very, very important concepts. Her heroes and heroines reflect that. Remember, she wrote Atlas Shrugged in 1957, the heroine of Atlas Shrugged, it's a heroine, so it's a woman, and, uh, and she's running a railroad in 1957. This is way before feminism became a thing. This is way before uh, women were running big corporations. So she was ahead of her time in terms of seeing the potential of a woman uh, to equal that of a man in terms of, for example, running a business. But she had a particular view of what femininity and masculinity was. She viewed um, masculinity, qua, you know, not every man is masculine, but qua masculinity is an orientation towards reality. It's, it's conquering reality. That's it's the, the hero that sails out to conquer the, the new world. And the, the essence of femininity, again, not every woman and not, uh, not everyone completely, but femininity, what femininity was, was hero worship. And that meant the worship of, of, of a hero, i.e. a man. So she had a particular psychological view of femininity masculinity. It's certainly not politically correct today to have it. And um, I don't have a particular view I mean, I, I suspect she's right, but I can't prove it because I don't know enough about it. But I think there's something there. There's definitely difference between men and women, That's right? True. In spite of the attempts of, of many people to, to deny the differences, the definitely differences. And I haven't heard a modern explanation of those differences. 
psychologically that that makes more sense to me that than Ayn's uh, understanding. Hey guys, today we're welcoming back IP Vanish VPN to the show. Now, IP Vanish has been a longtime sponsor of ours, so it's great to have them back. Let me tell you about IP Vanish. If you care about the security of your online activity, the easiest way to protect yourself is with IP Vanish VPN. It's rated 4.5 out of 5 stars in Trustpilot, and IP Vanish provides an encrypted connection for all of your internet traffic, helping prevent websites, Wi Fi providers, and even hackers from intercepting your data. You can help keep your financial details, personal info, and online activities safe from threats with IP Vanish. Now, we've got a limited time offer. You could save 50% off of monthly and annual subscriptions by going to ipvanish.com slash welcome. One more time, that's ipvanish.com slash welcome, all lowercase. Let's get back to the show. How do you reconcile the view, which I certainly agree with, and I think any rational person would agree with that men and women are profoundly different in many ways, with Rand's insistence on the blank slate? Well, because I think the blank slate, uh, it, it's misunderstood what you meant by it, just like it's misunderstood what Locke meant by it, right? Uh, the blank slate comes from Locke. Uh, John Locke talks about a blank slate. Uh, and I can't remember if Aristotle does or not. But the blank slate doesn't mean there's nothing there. It means there are no ideas there. But clearly, and Ayn Rand talks about this, clearly we're born as humans with a particular way of, of uh, conceptualizing the world, right? Our mind works in a particular way to form concepts. Uh, the neural networks are, are, are structured in a way to facilitate the conversion of perception to conception and create abstractions. It needs, uh, you know, f- it needs our engagement, it needs our focus, but it is, there is uh, this certain characteristics of our brain. Our brain is structured in particular ways. What we don't have is ideas. We're not born socialists or capitalists. We're not born um, with particular emotions, uh, with exception maybe a very, very primal, very, very, and and you wouldn't really call them emotions. They're more like sensations. Um, uh, You know, like uh, obviously we're born with the sensation of pain. We're born with the sensation of pleasure, right? We get those. It's the, those are we're, we're not a blank slate when it comes to pleasure or pain. The blank slate refers to again ideas. We don't have the concept chair before we're born. And again, think about who she's contrasting this with. She's contrasting with Plato and and many of the idealists and who, who come after. Where they believe that you have the chair in your mind, you just have to, in a sense, discover it. Right there. You have ideas in your mind, or, or you have the capacity to, 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 through a revelation, to discover those ideas. And then it says, no, in terms of ideas, there's nothing there. You open your eyes, you start seeing, getting sensations. Uh, as the brain develops, you get uh, percepts. And then you have this mechanism that allows you to create concepts from integrating and differentiating the different percepts. That is the that is what a conceptual uh, that's a kind of conceptual being uh, man is. So, for example, we have different inclinations. We have different, um, to some extent, abilities. Some of our minds might be wired better for mathematics, or or some of us are born with um, or seem to develop very young, uh, uh, incredibly memories, or incredibly inclination towards music. Uh, Mozart, right? So something, he was born differently than me, <laughs> given my abilities in music. So, uh, but the ideas, that, that, that there was no symphonies in his mind before he was born. It's just that his brain somehow was structured in a way that facilitated an understanding of music in a way that it doesn't elsewhere. And I think that's true of the differences between male and female. There's some difference there that maybe emphasizes certain aspects of, of life differently than others. Now, do I understand that fully? No, again, these are more psychological than philosophical and not my area of expertise by a long shot. So I'm a finance guy. So, um, uh, but I, but that's what she meant by blank slate, not blank of anything, of con- uh, but of ideas, of con- con- conceptual knowledge. But would you regard something as, let's suppose, the idea of object permanence, which we develop at a very, very early age before we're even lingual, uh, as something that contradicts the idea of the blank slate? No. So t- tell me what you mean by object permanence. That, that- well, well, like when children are extremely young, right? And you put, let's suppose you're holding an apple and you put it behind a curtain. The kid will look for where that apple is because it knows things don't, at a certain age, you realize things just don't vanish, that they exist independently of your yeah. vision of them. That's right. So I think that's something learned. That is something that develops as, as the child um, 
understands, first of all, he has to understand object, right? He doesn't understand object. When they're first born, everything's a mush. Yeah. Everything is, there's no differentiation. So first they have to differentiate. Then they have to differentiate through space. And then they have to differentiate through time. And then they get the idea of motion, that something can be here and then it's being moved somewhere else. But that's all the brain understanding the world. It's not already in the brain beforehand. It's, it's all developed in those first few months, in those first few years uh, that, it, that, it, that a baby uh, evolves. And the particular evolution, the, 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 there's a certain necessity to it because uh, the child doesn't have yet uh, really free will. The child is not engaging really in reason in any capacity. But the way our mind is structured, there is a certain sequence of event that happens to pretty much every child in terms of what they, what, what they learn when uh, over that first year or so of life. Uh, one of the things that I got wrong after reading The Fountainhead, and I'm curious to hear your perspective on this, when you read the, I read it first year in college, it's the copy at the Bucknell University Library, so whoever reads it, you can be holding the same. I gave a talk at Bucknell University. Oh, my, my condolences. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just a nightmare of a place. Um, I mean, one, no. of, one of the messages I got, and I, um, it, it, it's, it's, I'm curious to hear your thoughts, is the idea that when you're young and, and talented and kind of precocious, that you are going to be destined to this kind of life of loneliness, that people are going to kind of uh, shun you. Uh, and that's certainly the case frequently. But what I found, and especially now that I'm in my uh, senior citizen years, that when I find young people who are talented and precocious and make it happen, I am drawn to them and I'm very encouraging. And, and I think there's lots of other uh, adults who've accomplished things who seek out people like that and are their biggest cheerleaders. And you don't get that message from the family. No, because uh, I mean, although again, you could interpret uh, Rourke's um, relationship with, with Mallory and Rourke's relationship with some of the other, like the, the bricklayer and some others as exactly that. Rourke finding talent, talent and encouraging it. There's nobody to encourage Rourke, right. even though when he goes to uh, Cameron, uh, Cameron is an older architect, um, he's looking for that. And, 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 but Cameron is so disgruntled and given up on, on the world and on life that he can't really provide that to, to, to work. So, um, so yes, I think, I think it, after reading the Fountainhead, you get that sense, but it's partially reinforcing. I mean, I read the Fountainhead after Atlas Shrugged. Um, I read it when I was, yeah, I, w- I read it when I was a teenager and I was, you know, as a teenager, I felt, you know, in, in some senses alone. I mean, most te- teenagers, I think, do. Um, I, and now I had a new philosophy. I definitely felt alone because literally there was nobody. Yeah. Right? There was no internet. There was no connection. There was nobody. So I think we live in a world, a much better world in that sense. Today, um, uh, people who feel, uh, who think they're unusual or think they're, they're, they're different or, or have different ideas can find uh, people who share those ideas uh, on the internet and other places, there's communication. Connection in that sense has grown dramatically. So I think there's less of that as an issue today than ever before. But certainly when, you know, I'm, I'm much older than you are. And um, much, much, much older. Much, much older. And in those days, there was nothing, right? I, for three years, I thought I was the only person in the world who, who, who took Ayn Rand seriously. I didn't even know she was alive. Um, I, I, I was living in Israel, so it was, it was a long way away. But there was just no information. Today that doesn't exist anymore. So even if you do read the fountainhead and get the wrong idea out of it today, that it's much easier to correct that and fix that and get on the right path um, than there was in the past. Uh, when I was in college, a friend of mine, her roommate was reading at the shrug and I was just cringing at the idea because I, I, Bucknell, I knew it would be just like, I don't, I don't even want to hear it. And the message she got was, Oh, I love this book. Now no one pushes me around anymore. And I just wanted to kind of cut a bullet bullet in my head. What are some of the worst reactions that you've heard, uh, even positive, uh, to Rand's works in your career? Oh, wow. Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess at the end of the day, the worst reactions are the ones that ain't different, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, I like that. Go on. Or the ones that just, uh, you know, or where you go, where they, where they say something, you go, were they reading this book? I mean, I know people... Maybe the the worst are for the Fountainhead because the Fountainhead is more broadly loved, right? Oh, yeah. Alice Shrugged is, is much more narrow, although 
it was a big hit with the Tea Party, which which had had a you know that was interesting, right? When when I used to I used to go and give a lot of talks at the Tea Party, and when they they expressed their love of Ayn Rand, and and at the same time their love of Jesus, and and they they saw them completely compatible. They didn't have any clue that there was a difference here. That was pretty bizarre. But then you get the people who love the Fountainhead, um, who. You know, like Oliver Stone. Oliver Stone is a huge Fountainhead fan, right? He's a Marxist. He's an explicit Marxist. And his movies, particularly his early movies, were very Marxist in their orientation. Uh, And he wants to make a movie of the Fountainhead. He's dreamt of it. And at the end of the Fountainhead, according to Oliver Stone, Howard Rock joins a uh, a, a architectural commune where they, they design buildings not for money and not for profit, just out of the sheer love of designing buildings. Um, so just the ability of people to get what, what he got out of it is artistic integrity with no standards. That is uh, integrity to whatever you feel like, yeah. which is Ayn Rand would, you know, would shoot him. Um, I mean, she, she would go crazy about that. She's clear in the novel that no integrity involves particular values, life enhancing values. She's got a bunch of characters who are, anti-conformists and she makes fun of them but that's exactly what oliver stone is taking as the message of the whole thing is to be an anti-conformist conformist uh so it, it, lots of leftists i i found have that attitude and of course on the right you get the religionists who love uh, who love at shock but there was a period where i'd go around and everybody i met loved I loved Ayn Rand. Uh, you know, in the early in the early 20 teens, I think there was just this this idea that she was in, and everybody was supposed to. He, they didn't have a clue what she said. They didn't have a clue, certainly what she meant. And uh, yeah, I read those books, and you know, they were great. No, you know, no reflection in their ideas or in their lives. Hey guys, I want to take a sec to tell you about Blue Blocks. B L U B L O X. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are getting headaches, trouble sleeping, eye strain, stuff like that. What happens is when you stare at the screens all day, these symptoms tend to happen and Blue Blocks is here to help you stop them. What they did is they thought that all of those um, blue light blocking glasses on the market weren't cutting it. So they designed their own. They're made in optics laboratories in Australia. They've got stylish frames that have been featured in GQ and Vogue. Then they filter out 100% of UV light as well as blue light. Other brands ignore this. They've got a ton of different styles to choose from. They've got glasses for nearsighted, farsighted, or if you've got good vision, which hopefully some of you do. If you go to blueblocks.com slash welcome, B-L-U-B-L-O-X dot com slash welcome, you get 15% off. So they've got other amazing products. You try their blue light glasses, their low blue light bulbs, red light therapy devices, and 100% blackout sleep masks, which are all backed by the science. But this is the science that we like. They ship worldwide in rapid time, easy returns and exchanges. If you go to blueblocks.com, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com slash welcome, use promo code welcome, you get 15% off your product. And when you buy blue black sunglasses, eyeglasses, or sunglasses, they have both, they will buy eyeglasses for people in need. What a great product. Let's get back to the show. Isn't it true that Atlas Shrugged was written by the Illuminati? <sighs> Inspired by them. It was, it was taken over by them. And then, uh, and then um, no, I mean, uh, if the Illuminati are out there, I wish they'd make contact, right? It's the same with the elders of Zion, right? All, all these Jewish conspiracies about the Jews are going to take over the world. How come I'm not in on the conspiracy? I don't, I, you are, maybe you are, but uh, you know, I'm nobody. Nobody's come to me. Nobody's suggested anything. I'm now at the point where I get accused of being Mossad, and I'm very, very proud to have reached that achievement in my life. I can so, see it in my face. I've probably achieved that one a, a little bit before you, <laughs> given given that I was in, I, I was actually in military intelligence in the Israeli army. So oh. there's some credibility to the idea that I was uh, with the Mossad. But yes, I've been accused of that many, many, many times. Uh, one of the other things that I disagree with Rand is she was very insistent that people go out and vote for Nixon in 1972 against McGovern. This was not an endorsement of Nixon at all. This is very much McGovern is giving full-fledged statism and whatever it takes to stop this, you know, she'll pick, call her nose and, and vote for it. At the same time in 1980, she advocated that people should not vote, don't vote for Reagan, because from her perspective, anyone who is a, uh, a, critic, of, uh, uh, a critic of abortion who's pro-life 
does not understand the concept of individual rights. Well, it was Do more you, than that. It was well, more- that's part. I mean, that he brought religionism into politics. This is something that she was very opposed to. Do you disagree that Reagan deserves a large amount of credit for ending the Soviet Union, which was one of her big lifelong missions? I actually do disagree that Reagan deserves a lot of credit for ending the Soviet Union. I think the Soviet Union was heading by that point uh, into, uh, you know, into oblivion no matter what. Um, So I think he probably deserves some credit, primarily the mall stand he took more so than the military buildup. I, I just sure. don't buy into the military buildup, but, but, and I think it had more to do with people like Lech Valenza, you know, solidarity in Poland and, and some of the, some of the anti-Soviets in, in the Czech Republic and in Hungary and places like that. I actually, uh, you know, I was, I was at an event in Albania once and uh, the, 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 the guy who overthrew the communists in Albania, the first president of a post-communist Albania rushed up to me and he said, oh my God, we all read Ayn Rand in the 1980s. She inspired us to, to fight these commies. And, you know, yeah. we love Ayn Rand. Of course, the way he governed wouldn't suggest a love of Ayn Rand, but put that aside. But yeah, I think there's a hidden history um, of Ayn Rand inspiring um, yeah. uh, 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 dissidents uh, in the Soviet Union uh, to rebel against communism in the 80s. And suddenly I think Ronald Reagan by saying it's an evil empire, by standing up to them, at least on a podium. I don't think he stood up to them in reality that much, but at least giving a speech is important, particularly, you know, one of the yeah. bully pulpit makes a difference, huge difference. It's one of, you know, if I can bring up a controversy, right? One of the real evils of last year is that of 2020 is that nobody stood up to the Chinese on Hong Kong. Nobody, right? No, you know, here was a, supposedly Donald Trump tough on China, not a peep, not a word about what they were doing in Hong Kong. And that's a real travesty. I mean, we, we miss Ronald Reagan in that sense. So, no. So I think I think from my perspective, yes, he, he made a difference. Uh, it would have happened anyway, maybe longer, maybe more bloodshed, hard to tell. But he made a difference. Um, I Look, I would have probably voted for Ronald Reagan in 1980. Um, I think everything she feared about what would happen under Ronald Reagan has come true, uh, is coming true. I think uh, the fact that he implanted the religious right dead center, the the moral majority in those days, it was called dead center in the Republican Party and created this, uh, the Republican Party now is associated with the religious right. And that that's absolutely right. And I think it's destroyed the Republican Party as a, as a cogent opposition party to the left. So I think that's true. On the other hand, from my perspective, right, as somebody who grew up during that period, it bought us time, right? Ronald Reagan and Mag- Margaret Thatcher shifted the conversation in the world, shifted the attitudes in the world for a period. It's gone. That that sense has disappeared, right? But it, it, it gave us probably 20 years of at least momentum with some economic growth, with some a, a changed attitude towards liberty and freedom, with a third, certain positivism about the world and about America that I value. So, um, so thank you, Honor Reagan, for doing that. And uh, but it's it's dead. She was right. At the end of the day, long term, he was a he was a bad force. Uh, not him personally, again, but by bringing in and embracing the religious right and. And, and giving it such importance uh, and, and such centrality in the Republican Party. I think there's something very Randian about his quote where he says, let me tell you my strategy for the Cold War. We win, they lose. Yeah, and, and look, yes. I mean, I, I, mean I, love, I love Ronald Reagan quotes, right? I love less what he did. Sure. <laughs> quotes are great. Um, he read Ayn Rand, and he was a big fan of Ayn Rand. So it, it doesn't surprise me that some of what he says sounds like, like it's coming from her. I mean, in his journals, I think in his journals, he, he writes about the fact that he was a, a real fan of Atlas Shrugged. There seems to be an enormous taboo among objectivist circles, I'm even scared to ask you, discussing Rand's life, specifically the NBI years. Do you think that that is warranted? Well, I mean, I think, I, I think it's, it was warranted up to a point, right? Because um, why discuss kind of the the the... It, it, all the personalities when we've got so much work to do to, to engage with the philosophy and engage with the culture, with ideas, why spend time and focus on pulling on, on people trying to pull her down personally when it's the ideas that are really important. But I, I don't shy away from speaking about the brand, the, the brand in years, <laughs> NBI years, however you want to call it, but I don't know much about it. And, and if the reality is, 
I don't care that much. That is uh, uh, about her personal life that much. Um, and but the other aspect, I know most of what I know about the NBI days from reading Nathaniel Brandon. Yeah. Um, and of course, I, I think he uh, he is his uh, he is his worst prosecutor. That is, I think he makes the case for why he was a really really bad guy um, in his own book. You, you don't need now. Uh, history will come out. Over time, because we've got the archives, we've got everything she wrote about it, we've got all this stuff. Um, history will come out about those years. I think that it'll shed a lot of light to it. I think that will clarify a lot of the history around it. Uh, that'll be interesting. And uh, and uh, but it's too early to really delve into that and really spend a lot of time over that. There's a war to be won. The, you know, the world is falling apart, and we're gonna dabble in in what exactly happened then and who did what to whom. I don't find that interesting. That's me. I, other people might find it amazingly interesting and all the power to them. It's just not what I, I'm always focused on the future, not the past. The, just the one issue I have with this specifically is her husband, Frank O'Connor, who was loved for life. They're married for, I think, over 50 years. They kind of, she, it was loving for a sight for her, for him, not so much. She tripped him on the yeah. the movie. He goes home to talk to his brother, says, I met this Russian girl who talked my ear off. I couldn't understand what she was saying. Uh, later, she ran into him again in the library. They struck up a conversation. And they never stopped having that conversation. Yep. But she ended up supporting him. She was the breadwinner of that family as he studied art and um, design. So when she kind of asked him for permission to have an affair with her protege, it's not, yes, they're adults. Yes, it's a voluntary situation. But I just think a lot of people, including myself, find that to be cruel. I mean, maybe. Um, my view is <laughs> she was a genius. She was an exceptional human being. Certainly. Um, it, she was unconventional about everything. She challenged um, our, our views on pretty much every topic out there, philosophically, politically, aesthetically. She, she challenged everything. Why would it be shocking that she challenged our conceptions of marriage or conceptions of fidelity or, or, or monogamy or conceptions of sex? Um, I would be in a sense shocked if she wasn't, if she, she sure. ended up being too super conservative, uh, whether how they did it, what the arrangement exactly was, who said what to whom, I don't know. I wasn't there. All we have is, is the Brandons and okay. clearly they're biased. So let's wait maybe until all the history comes out. Um, and look, maybe it was, maybe, maybe it'll turn out that it, but you know, the other thing is it turned out badly for her, right? The whole yes. thing turned out badly for her. So, but but part of what she advocated for is we don't know with certainty some things unless we try them. And sometimes you have to take risks in life. Sometimes you do things that polite society views as immoral or unjust or whatever. But if you think they're right and if you think your happiness is at stake, don't bend. So uh, I, I'm, I, I applaud her for being unconventional in this respect and for experimenting. She was a young Russian girl who had very little, from my understanding, experience with sex, experience with relationships, experience with men. And she got married fairly young, given all that. Yeah. You know, I, 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 at least she told her husband it would have been a thousand times worse and, and, and against her philosophy if she had gone behind, her ba behind his back. So... Uh, I respect her for being upfront about it, upfront about her feelings and upfront about her desires. And uh, if it was, it was tough on him. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's tough. Sometimes relationships are tough. Uh, one of the most commendable aspects of objectivism, my point of view is this claim that we shouldn't be expected to be God. You don't start from a premise of omniscience. You start with the reality living on earth. You're going to have limited information, limited knowledge, and if you're going to fault someone for not having infinite knowledge, your philosophy does not relate to reality. Uh, given Rand died in 82, it's been f almost 40 years since then. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a, a very difficult question to answer. How do you think her worldview would have changed in those 40 years since, given so many things that have developed uh, after she has passed? I mean, you never know in a sense that she was a genius. I'm not. And she was a, she was a kind of genius that I'm not in. Every time I read her nonfiction essays, I'm blown away by the perspective she has that is different than the way I would have approached it or that anybody I know would have approached it. She, she really was an original mind in ways that I don't think people appreciate unless they read some of her political cultural analysis. She, she weaves 
culture and psychology and philosophy and politics all into one beautifully seamlessly and, and comes up to conclusions that, that often are surprising. On the other hand, from my perspective, I think everything that's happened over the last 40 years has basically affirmed what she thought. Uh, history has played out to a large, expect- large extent to the way I think she would have expected, maybe with one exception. And that is that the world is better off than I think she would have predicted yeah. um, 40 years. So if she was sitting in 82 and I told her then who the next few presidents were going to be, right? And and what generally broadly the policy, she would have predicted collapse. So, you know, I think, yeah. right? I think. Yeah. And and what is what has happened? And I give some credit to her. I give some credit to somebody she wouldn't have wouldn't have liked me giving credit to, but somebody like Milton Friedman, von Mises, and von Mises. I think something changed in the sixties and seventies. There, there was a, 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 a capitalism stopped being an, a, a three letter word. It stopped being an ugly word that people condemned. It, it was became a word that was acceptable. I think that's why Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher could get elected. It's because of Atlas Shrugged and Free to Choose and and some of the work that Milton Friedman and his students did to make markets acceptable. Also, the failure of socialism, which was they were living it right then, particularly in in England. Um, and so, and then there was this revolution that was global. I mean, that's what's surprising, right? What's surprising is what happened in China. Now, I think it's reversing, unfortunately, yes. for the last five years. And tragically, I mean, truly tragically, because I know a lot of people in China. Uh, I've been there many times, and it's it, it's just heart-wrenching what's happening over there. But also just generally, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong, you never would have sat in 1982 and said, the Asian tigers are going to be this rich and this successful. And, and, but they adopted markets. So where did they get that from? They didn't get it directly from Ayn Rand, but they got it indirectly from Rand, Friedman, Mises, and the, 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 the people influenced by them. Um, so I don't think she saw that. And then, of course, the just boom in technology, just the, yeah. the computer revolution, the internet. I mean, what the internet has done, the impact it has had, the, the, the fact that all her works are accessible now like this, anytime, any place, anywhere, but also all of human knowledge. The entire scope of human knowledge is available to anybody at, 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 at just any time. It's, it's an amazing time to be alive in that respect, right? And so the whole development of tech, the development of, uh, of uh, freedom, economic freedom in other countries, the, the rise of Asia, uh, even the fact that Europe has survived as much as it has, in spite of having these horrible mixed economies, they've still managed to do okay um, and, and, and not collapse on themselves. I, I think that would have been the only thing that would surprise her. And, and you know, we as objectivists, and I think many others, it, we always look at the situation today and all we see is doom and gloom and the world is going to collapse tomorrow. It didn't collapse yesterday, but it's going to collapse tomorrow. And I think the last 40 years should teach us to be a little bit more um, uh, you know, thoughtful about that. Look at all the things that are going on in the world. There are positive trends. Part of them are technological business oriented. There are parts of the world that we never look at that are developing and getting better. And yes, even if America is doomed, the world is not doomed because this is not Rome in the sense that in Rome, all the knowledge was concentrated. It all was in one place. Yeah, there was a little bit in Constantinople later, but basically it was Rome. And when Rome fell, engineering knowledge was lost. Philosophical knowledge was lost. Political knowledge, it was gone. Today, we live in a world where knowledge, information um, is, is dispersed in a way that it has never been before. You're not, you're not going to lose the works of Aristotle again, right? Unless, unless we wipe out all the computers in the world, which could happen. But it's, it's even more far-fetched than most people imagine. Uh, the same is true of, of, of Rand or all these others. So the knowledge is out there somewhere all over the place. Even if one country collapses or even a region collapses, good ideas will still live on. And the Renaissance would happen a lot faster, I think, than it did after the collapse of Rome. Yeah, one of the things I hate is the concept of fiscal conservatives for conservatism because it seems to me it's just an excuse where people want to cut government, but they don't have the courage to say why it should be cut or what should be cut, but just basically to outsource it should be cut across the board. And there's that quote, there's a great deal of ruin in a nation. So when conservatives say that the 
uh, national debt is too much. Well, conceptually, one trillion and a hundred trillion and fifty trillion—it's—it's it's all it's just numbers on a screen. Uh, that person speaking doesn't have any idea of what what the tipping point is going to be, uh, other than just having some sense that more is bad. But you don't know what what that point is until it's too late. So I think there's a kind of disingenuous uh, there among fiscal uh, conservatism. Well, but it's worse than that because because as soon as they get into power. <laughs> oh yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Spend like everybody else, right? So they talk. They, you know, conservatives at their best are a good opposition party, but in power they're pathetic. They're, they're terrible. They they do exactly everything they criticize the Democrats for doing. They do, uh, and and in a sense, it, it worse because because they used to stand for something. So yeah, physical conservatives or conservatives in general is hopeless. Hey guys, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's noticed things are getting more and more expensive as inflation is hitting us. And with all this printing and spending by people in Washington, the dollar's end is getting closer and closer. Now, as you all know, if the government continues this out of control printing and spending, the dollar could continue free fall and lose its coveted role as the world reserve currency. I'm not the only one who's seeing dark days ahead for the dollar. Now more than ever, people should be diversifying their portfolio. And that means gold and silver and Hartford, American Hartford Gold is a company you can trust. They sell physical gold and silver delivered right to your door or inside of your IRA and they make it easy. They're the highest rated firm in the country. They've got an A plus rating from the Better Business Bureau, thousands of satisfied clients. You'd call them right now. They'll give you up to $1,500 worth of free silver on your first order. Don't wait, call them now. The number is 866-599-5502. 866-599-5502 or text Michael to 65532. Again, 866-599-5502 or text Michael to 65532. The gold standard. It's a pretty solid standard. Let's get back to the show. One of the things I um, criticized uh, William F. Buckley for in my book, The New Right, and he's pretty much the villain of that book, is uh, his two-facedness and his tastelessness. Uh, even though he has that very rarefied manner and rarefied accent, uh, he's very kind of declassé, to use a term he would probably like, in his behaviors. I'm specifically thinking of when Rand died in 1982. Yep. The very first line of his essay, The Catholic William F. Buckley, is, Ayn Rand is dead and so is the philosophy she birthed. It was, in fact, stillborn, which is a very kind of dark and horrible metaphor about someone whose body was still uh, warm in the ground. Uh, what did you think of the Rand-Buckley relationship? Well, first, I actually like that quote from Buckley because, you know, here we are. I forget when he died exactly, but uh, so many decades later. And who's still relevant and who's still alive? Who's being read? How many people read Buckley books these days? Uh, almost none. So the stillborn philosophy is only growing. Uh, you know, her books are being read by the hundreds of thousands every year. And the memory of William F. Buckley is slowly going away and, and people won't remember him much in the future and mostly as a negative force out there. Well, I mean, Buckley made sure to exclude Ayn Rand from what was uh, developing as this conservative coalition, right? There was a coalition established in the 1950s and 60s of uh, what were physical conservatives, free market type-ish kind of things, people who generally believed in free market, sometimes called the libertarians within the, within the Republican Party, the foreign policy conservatives, the tough on the Soviet Union and 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 everything else, and then the religious right, the 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 socially conservative, um, and Ayn Rand fit into two of those, but she was a radical in both, right? She wasn't a physical conservative; she was a laissez-faire separation of of state from economics, and in foreign policy, she was a, um, a she was against the war in Vietnam, uh, even though she was probably the biggest anti-communist around, but she didn't believe we had to go to the other side of the planet to fight, yeah. you know, wars and die uh, for this. Let the people over there fight for it, but, you know, wait until they land here and they won't because she believed that communism was impotent and would self-implode. And of course, she was completely opposed to the religious right and the whole social conservative agenda um, and program. So, uh, you know, Buckley had the opportunity to find to somehow create even a bigger tent to include her. But I think he was politically astute enough to understand that that probably for his purposes was not tenable, that there would be too many conflicts and why create those conflicts. So he made sure to kick her out of this big tent, which I think in the long run, um, I don't, she probably would have kicked herself out, would be my guess. 
but it, it, you know, so so it wouldn't have happened anyway. Uh, so he probably did her a favor. There is, let me put it this way, because I don't know the details, but there's going to be interesting stuff written in the future about the relationship of Buckley and Rand and his, let's call it, obsession with her. Um, we have some letters he wrote, or postcard he wrote, to, which are kind of interesting, after he kicked her up. So um, he, he was a little obsessed with her, and, uh, and, and I think he was intelligent enough to know that she was a real intellectual force. And that he that he, if he believed in the ideas he believed in, he needed to crush her. But he 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 wasn't completely whole with that because he knew there was a real something there. Uh, yeah, he he's he's a piece of work that yeah, uh, um, definitely. Nothing. Do you think that uh, uh, objectivism has a bit of a marketing problem? I don't know. I don't know. It, it, it's a question of what you mean by marketing at the end of the day. The, you know, objectivism's main problem, I think, is that it it opposes pretty much all the ideas out there. And it, and it stands for a particular view in, in an uncompromising way. So, for example, you know, I've, I've lost uh, quite a few subscribers over the last few days uh, over the uh, Texas abortion bill. Right. Which which I am opposed to uh, vehemently. I I position myself as basically pro-abortion or pro-choice or whatever people want. I mean, that is terrifying to so many people. It's horrifying to them. And they, you know, they, they just run for it. Um, the same people who might be attracted to objectivism views on laissez-faire or, or might be attracted to views on, on morality, uh, you know, they find one issue and they point, you know, I, I, I had a hard time um, with, uh, with people over Trump. Um, so it's, the main issue, I think, is that we really do challenge people thoroughly over their ideas. And I think, so you might agree with us on 60%, but so vehement about the other 40% yeah. that, that it gets, um, gets in a way. But that's the nature of philosophy. This is the difference between us and, let's say, libertarianism is a broad tent. Um, it doesn't have strong positions on a lot of things. It doesn't go there. I think it's its weakness, but it's also what makes it, allows it to be bigger. Um, because it, it doesn't have a particular view of morality or a particular view of, 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 of epistemology or metaphysics or religion, for example. Uh, objectivism does, but that's the nature of philosophy. Philosophy, by its nature, is a, a particularly a system that has positions about everything in a way because it, it encompasses all of human knowledge, um, is going to be a challenge for people. And I don't, I don't see how you... I don't think marketing is the right word. Uh, it, 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 it is, uh, it, it is, it's, it's something more fundamental than marketing. Although, yeah, we could always use better marketing. Um, Rand said that the three great philosophers with three to study are the three A's, Aristotle, Aquinas, and Ayn Rand. Uh, given Aquinas was a very, very strong theist, uh, he, and he, a lot of his work, um, which was just all over the place, not in a bad way, just profoundly comprehensive. It yep. was about proving the existence of God in rationalist or uh, you know rational terms. What do you think she admired so much about Aquinas? Well, what she admired about Aquinas is that, in spite of being in the midst of Middle Ages um, uh, Europe, it, it, at the heart of the Catholic Church, committed to that Catholic Church and everything that was going on in the world around him. Um, in, in the midst of a kind of a Neoplatonist place, here is this guy who, who discovered, who read Aristotle and, and was inspired by Aristotle to, to rethink what he believed. Uh, he allowed Aristotle to challenge him and ultimately to challenge much of the church's teaching. I mean, Aquinas brings happiness into the conversation. Yeah. Whereas Christianity before that was all about uh, August, uh, you know, Augustinian uh, uh, suffering. And, and that's the essence of life, uh, you know. Maybe Jordan Peterson inspired by that, but you know it's all about suffering and and pain and 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 so on. Uh, Aquinas suddenly discovers in Aristotle a view of life that's about happiness, about virtues that lead to individual happiness. And yes, he keeps God, and and the reason he's struggling, I think, the reason he spent so much time trying to prove God, is that he's trying to prove God to himself. You know, he's trying to struggle between this idea of faith and reason, and how do I uh, articulate them? How do I uh, combine them? And he's constantly fight. That is a fight that he's fighting inside of himself. And that's why he has to keep proving more proofs of God, more proofs of God, because 
He needs to convince himself more than anybody else. But he gets, first of all, he's a systematic thinker. So he does have a, a, a universal view based on Aristotle and the church and trying to combine them. Not very well, but trying to combine them. And then, and then he brings Aristotle back into civilization. So she credited, and I think many historians and, and, and um, historians of, of, of philosophical thought credit him with shifting Western civilization away from Plato towards Aristotle, uh, bringing about ultimately the Renaissance and everything that that results in that, well, whether it's a scientific revolution, the Enlightenment, America, capitalism, all of that is, is basically on the shoulders of Aquinas. So she admired him enormously uh, in spite of uh, his, his religiosity. She admired him immensely as a thinker and as somebody who, within the context of his knowledge, the context of his time, did the best that he could to bring reason and logic and Aristotle into Western civilization and anchor him there. And I think to this day, we, we benefit from that because who else is there? When I was in college at the aforementioned accursed Bucknell, <laughs> there was a, a business professor and he wrote on the board fair and unfair. And he asked people to give examples of each. This was a fair thing, this is an unfair thing. And then after everyone was done, just above those two terms, he wrote, I like it and I don't like it. So let's focus on your work. Why is equal unfair and what does fair even mean? Well, fair means just. Fair means justice. So fairness is people getting what they, quote, deserve. Deserve in a particular context, right? So in, uh, and, uh, uh, so unfair is when you do something where you deserve X and you don't get X. You get Y, you get Z, you get something you don't deserve. That's unfair. And I think people have... Uh, a sense that that's generally historically what fairness meant and what justice meant. Over the last hundred years or so, um, it, the fairness and and, uh, and justice have, have have shifted, partially uh, partially due to uh, Catholic philosophers, partially or Catholicism, uh, partially due to uh, Marx and and uh, uh, even worse philosophers that came later, egalitarians and so on. And the whole concept of fairness and justice became what's fair is equal, what's just is equal. Everybody being treated equal is fair, is just. But is that true, right? Um, is, is it fair and just that two students get the same grade even though one knows the stuff and one doesn't? I mean, most people say, no, it's not fair. We still, you know, we still have that old sense of fairness and justice. But today... Uh, whether it's uh, the postmodernism, the critical race theory, the egalitarians who dominate the world today, the intellectual would say, no, no, it's it's unfair. They should be equal in outcome. That's and, and if they're not, then we have to do something about it. Either knock the good guy down or knock the good the bad guy up, the the, the one who doesn't have the knowledge up, or both, which is what they what, what they're constantly trying to do is knock the people who have knowledge down and knock the people who don't have it up some way. And usually, usually by force. Um, so is it fair that LeBron James is better at basketball than I am? Now, my answer to that is clearly yes. <laughs> he, he's got the build for it, but he's also practiced. He's worked hard at it. I have not. You know, I have not. I know objectivism better than LeBron James. Is that fair? Yes. And is the fact that LeBron James is a better basketball than me fair? Absolutely. And is it fair to break his legs so that I can play one-on-one -on -one with him and have a chance? No, most people would say no. So now let's extrapolate that to economics. Is it fair that Bill Gates made gazillions of dollars? Yeah, he changed the world. He sold people products that they wanted and were willing to give up 100 bucks, let's say, for a, a software program because that software program was worth more than 100 to them. And he did it on such a scale that he became a gazillionaire. That's fair. In the context of economics, fair is getting... Uh, rewarded based on the value you create, the economic value you create. Now, it doesn't mean that a teacher teaching has not created enormous value in spite of the fact that she gets a poor salary. It's just that it's on a small scale. It's just she's impacting fewer students. Indeed, one of the trends of the future will probably be super teachers, teachers who use the internet to teach millions of students and now become gazillionaires, right? Because they, they, they bring the value to scale. So, Fairness does not mean equality. Justice does not mean equality. We should not. We should fight the left. We should fight the egalitarians with everything that we have, because if justice becomes equality, we're finished. It, you know, the world is dead.
In her Playboy interview, Rand made the offhand comment that she wasn't sure that she wanted to attract as many people as religion does. And I took that to be kind of an elitist statement. Do you think it's accurate to describe objectivism as elitist? And that's not even to say that elitism is a bad thing. Yeah, I was just going to say, I'm not sure elitism is a bad thing. It, it, you know, what Rand recognized and what I think, again, is playing out in front of our eyes and is always played out in history. It's that the minority of intellectuals shape the world. They have the influence. Um, you know, uh, at every level, it's it's the stories that the economists, the philosophers, the intellectuals are telling us that we buy into and then shape our behaviors. Uh, and, and you can see it all around. Right now, you can see it on the left with critical race theory and so on. I mean, nobody thinks of that, right? Unless you're, you're an Ivy child, unless you're an elite. And then they filter it down and then a bunch of people get excited about it and they go and act. But without these ideas, nothing happens. Um, I mean, even, even the, the, the kind of uh, rise of the working class Trumpism, if you will, the, 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 these dissatisfied working class people. Why are they so dissatisfied, right? They're, they're incredibly dissatisfied because they've been told by a certain group of elitists that they, their jobs are guaranteed. They'll always have these jobs. And yet the jobs disappear. The jobs will come back not to worry, everything's fine, they don't. Don't worry, we'll take care of you. The government will take care of you, we'll send you checks. Don't worry, just the last thing you wanna do is actually move to where the jobs are or actually change or, or, or retrain yourself. And they are being abandoned by the elites, they are being rejected by the elite, and this is a response to that rejection. They, you know, okay, you haven't done anything for us. We're going to go with somebody who represents the exact opposite of you or, or doesn't really represent the exact opposite, but in our minds represent the exact opposite with you. And we're going to go with that. And let's see, maybe maybe that'll be the solution. So it's always the elites that are um, telling, uh, in a sense, teaching us the history, telling, for example, in the inequality book, we talk about the fact that everybody today accepts that the working class over the last, working class and lower middle class over the last 40 years have stagnated. They make no more income than they did in the past. Now that is blatantly wrong. That's, but there's no way that's true if you look at the, at, the, at the economics correctly, if you look at the actual numbers, if you adjust for changes and, and so on for inflation, all this, all this stuff. And yet, if you say it enough times, if the elite buys into this, and every, every time I debated a leftist, he tells the same story. Exactly the same story. Ronald Reagan destroyed the economy by doing X, Y, Z. That seventies were this wonderful time. It was, it was fantastic. I mean, they all tell they it's out of the same playbook. But they've said it so many times now. They believe it, and yeah. most people believe it. And so, in that sense, elites, intellectual elites, not just not financial elites, intellectual elites, shape the world. They determine history. They determine. You're on, you're on running out of time. What has been your favorite part of this interview? <laughs> Oh, what has been the favorite part of this interview? Um, yeah, talking about some of the stuff about Ayn Rand that maybe I don't get to talk about often. So you pushing a little bit on, on some of the issues around objectivism. Uh, it's always good to get it out there because in the sense that there's bad marketing out there or in a sense that there is people think wrongly about Rand, e even the issue of the blank slate, I think is really valuable talking about because people don't think of it properly. They don't think about her relationships properly. They don't think about the history properly. So giving me an opportunity to talk about that stuff is valuable. To correct some of the misconceptions out there is value. So that's, uh, that is always fun. You are welcome.